Hi, everybody. Welcome back. It is uh, day three of TIFF Summit, and it's our second part of our afternoon. We have a, another great speaker coming up. Uh, if you're just joining us, my name is Andy Wheelock, along with Melanie Kitchen and our special presenter today, Amy Bloom. Amy is a staff development specialist at Erie Tuboses uh, at in Western New York. And before that, she wore many hats, including uh, art teacher, computer tech teacher, integration specialist, and assistant principal. What haven't you done in education? <laughs> <laughs> to, Janitor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to follow Amy on social media, she's at at AJ Bloom 2PNT0, and you'll be able to find that link in the conference webpage, bit.ly slash TIFF Summit. And you can also find Amy at bloomintoedtech.com. That's all one word. So again, all of that will be there as well as Amy's session resources. So without further delay, here is Amy Bloom. Thank you, Amy. Perfect. Thank you so much, Andy, for the awesome welcoming. Um, I hope everybody is doing well in this beautiful summer day. And we are going to begin by looking at online learning adventures. So just as Andy said, my name is Amy Bloom. Currently, I'm a staff development specialist, and this is some ways that you can get a hold of me. My Twitter handler, if you do want to email me after the presentation to ask questions, please phone a, phone a Bloom any way that you can. I'm always open and receptive to uh, answering questions. Um, just like Andy said, I spent a good chunk of my career in the computer lab teaching computer education, technology, and uh, computer science to pre-K through eighth grade students. Uh, I began my career as an art teacher, and I really fell in love with the ways that we could combine arts and computer science. So I sometimes spent a little bit more time on extravagant backgrounds and here and there, but uh, rest assured, I'm going to show you some ways that you can uh, equally create some of the stuff I'm going to show you today. Okay, so let's begin. Some of our objectives for today is you're going to learn how to gamify your online lessons using a variety of tools. There is no one right way to do this. I'm going to give you a couple of examples later today on how you can uh, gamify your lesson using something as simple as uh, a Google, a, Go a Google, a Google Sheets or slides, as well as a variety of other tools out there from the World Wide Web. The whole premise of this is going to be built in Google Sites, but I'll have you know, and I'll talk a little bit about my brainchild in a little bit. I originally built something like this in Weebly many, many years ago. Okay, so let's talk about the difference between game-based learning and gamification. So game-based learning is learning content through the use of games. Gamification is the process of adding games or game-like elements to something such as a task, so to encourage participation. Uh, my favorite, my Canadian friends, uh, is going to Tim Hortons and the roll up the rim to win. I'm gonna keep buying your coffee, even if I keep losing, because it's adding that game element. Uh, so there's, there's so many ways that we add that gaming element. I would like to say sometimes my paycheck is a gaming element. I'll keep showing up to work if you keep paying me. Um, but it is the adding the elements to a lesson that you can turn gamification. So the whole premise of choosing your own learning adventure is we're gonna add apps, we're gonna smash the two together. Okay, it's probably mean that a couple of you, especially if you're a parent like your, myself, why are you so entertained with watching kids play videos on YouTube? Um, I wish I would restart my career and become a professional YouTuber. Um, un unwrapping presents would probably be my forte. However, I always tell my kids, okay, video games, time is up, go outside and play. And my kids are always like, oh, fine. And then they'll find ways, can I watch TV? TV in 2020 means YouTube. Watching YouTube in 2020 means watching kids play video games. Why are kids so enthralled in video games? Why can't I get my 10 year old up in the morning to go learn online? But the minute that Fortnite today decides to come up with a new game, he's up at six o'clock in the morning, begging me to go on to check it out. So why gaming? It's engaging, it emphasizes risk-taking, it's motivational, it's challenging. Students show up, no matter how many times they might lose at a game, they show up and they will try and try again. 
imagine an educational system that allows them the same um, capacity to do so that where they become engaged in the learning process where they want to keep learning and they want to keep trying. So we do need to nurture some skills and probably from uh, pandemic um, and our experiences with the pandemic and moving on to an online uh, learning environment is that we can all agree that nobody, especially our students, we're prepared for this type of learning. And a lot of it has to do with independence. Uh, we need to start instilling skills of innovation, imagination, information, how they can they communicate, investigate, and more importantly, how are they digital citizens within this realm of learning? Their emotional intelligence, the ability to collaborate. Collaboration is not a born skill, it's a skill that is fostered. So how are we in education providing those skills for students? So when they become older, those skills are transferred into productive adults. Now, these are two resources from LinkedIn and indeed uh, hard skills. You know, the skills that you learn from, for example, mobile development, web design, so on and so forth. But we can also argue that the soft skills, the creativity, the collaboration, problem solving, critical thinking, adaptability are all important skills that we need to foster in our students as well. So adding gaming elements can help us do this. So the game making process, for the sake of this presentation, I am going to show you how you are going to make a game making lesson for your students. I spent a, like 15 years of my career with students teaching them the same principles I'll be teaching you for them to create a game, especially in my seventh, eighth grade classes for students to use at the lower level. So talk about the authenticity, talk about a product that is being used within an authentic experience. So my students would create a game in eighth grade or my seventh graders used to do digital storytelling for the younger students, market it to the younger students and they had to come up with a marketing plan and they had to go back and reiterate and redesign based on the outcome of authentic student evaluations. But the process for designing your games, your lessons into adding gamification has pretty much the same process. Uh, it is the designing, it's the, it's the growth mindset, it's defining, ideate, prototype, test, emphasize, and it goes around and around in a circle. So for example, um, the project that I'm going to show you in just a moment and show you how I started to build this, uh, actually came out about because I teach um, a couple Google classes online and instead of teaching teachers how to use Google Slides, for example, to make a slideshow presentation, I teach them how they can make it an interactive lesson, how they can uh, take the lesson or take the Google Slides show and make it a choose your own adventure. Okay, using hotspots and linking within. So I'm going to show you in a moment, but when I did this, a lot of the teachers were like, oh, this is awesome. When I taught it, my students were like, this is awesome. I actually started this lesson using Microsoft Office because you could throw it in kiosk mode. Google, you can't. And I'll show you an example of that in a moment. So I was like, how can I create the same kind of gaming learning environment, choose your own environment where students can't progress through a slideshow presentation? So that is where I started to emphasize and ideate. So going back to the gaming elements, what are some shared elements of a game? Now this is regardless if you play a digital game or if you sit down with family game night and you're playing Monopoly, which I'm not very good at. Uh, challenge, it's a problem or a scenario that a, pro a player must overcome. There's always rules, the structure, boundaries that you must play within the game. The interactivity, how do players experience the game or experience the game with each other? Feedback, reflection, uh, you did a great job. We always like that, like, oh, you, you beat a level, great job, or wah, wah, wah. You remember the dog from Duck Hunt? You gotta start all over again. Conflict, what is the competition between players? What, what system of the games utilize the rules? And the goals and the outcomes. What are the desired results, such as winning, losing, or advancing? 
OK, so maybe in education you have seen other ways to include choice into your curriculum. And I am going to show you a couple of those and how we are going to take some of these premises here and apply it to using Google Sites. So, for example, um, I always like this choice boards from Slides Mania, and all of these here are for you. If you're unfamiliar with any of these, these are great already for you to use uh, lessons and or templates that you could turn in your to your own. So if you reflect back to how I was talking about uh, a lot of these slide decks being linear in uh, navigation, meaning that even when I present, even though this is interactive, my students can bypass this and go to the slide of their choice. Now I'm not sure, but there is a small way to get around this in a Google slide. So just a little side information. If you do take a shape and draw it over your shape, I know it looks scary, everything's gone away, and you link it to slides and presentation, if you link it to itself, click apply, transparent, and this is what I teach a lot in my Google classes, this is what I taught my students, and I send it backward just to make sure that the start button is above it. Let me show you what that does do. And it's a workaround for you if you choose to use the Google Slides model. So I cannot advance because I linked this um, transparent box to itself where I can only hit the start button. But what some teachers found frustrating, they're like, Amy, can't you fix this? Like I have a straight direct line to Google. Uh, where the students can't advance because they feel it loses some of the authenticity of the game based choice board or have a student choose their own adventure. And I was like, you know, here I am thinking, I'm like, yeah, you're right. You're absolutely right. So back in the day, um, and I might be dating myself here, we used to have, um, oh, what is it? Um, Oh, I had the word in my head earlier today. Web, oh, what is it called? Oh my goodness, I can't believe I, I'm having a, a mind rela relapse here. WebQuest. WebQuest, yeah. yeah thank you. <laughs> <laughs> WebQuest, thank you. I knew you. where you are going for. Thank you, thank you. I just dated myself. This is so 2002, where we used, they used to have templates where you can make WebQuests using sites. And I was like, oh, I used to do that and kind of gamify it and use Weebly and I was like, what if we took the same premise, the same concept, and used a Google site? So I began to think, and I and then during pandemic, I've been talking to many districts because just like our host here, I uh, work with a variety of school districts. And one common thread um, that we all I, I have come across is that our students don't know how to learn online. And no, it, it's it's difficult for them. It's difficult for adults to learn online. You need to be, uh, you know, you, you need to be self-focused, independent. And in our educational system currently, they raise their hand, they show up to class, we're, we're holding them through, and now we're giving them the ability to learn on their own. So I was like, hmm, what can I do to support that? So right now I have to admit that this is my brainchild and this is what I've been working through, but I wanted to show you, and then I'll show you how I built this. Um, this is Welcome Online Superheroes. This is everything that you need to know about how to become a superhero, and this is all using Google Sites. Okay, so here we have the rules, the welcome, the storyline. Um, if you're teaching about any kind of aspects of gamification, I have so many resources for you, but what do we fall in love with with the game? Storyline, do, does uh, Mario get to rescue the princess at the end? Uh, I'm not really sure what the storyline is with Fortnite and I play it all the time, but it's survival, I guess. Um, and you can think about all the storylines, what makes a great game a game? So get them connected, that is your hook. And that is just basically taking your objectives and making a narrative. What are the rules to the game? All right, so you want to be a certified online superhero. Before we, you know, conduct our online learning adventure, you must complete minimally one activity in each of the in each of the adventures below. 
So if you know anything about gaming, they have the experience points and there's different adventures and then there's superpowers. So each character that I created is related to a superpower. Okay, so let me just give you a little bit of examples of what each student can choose. Now notice I went when I clicked on that and I'm going to do it again. Slow mo. I clicked on community leader. Now look, I'm still in the same website. Okay, but you'll notice none of these web pages are showing up here. I have full control over the game. And all that is is simply hiding the website link and I'll show you that in a moment. So here you might choose to complete all activities listed below, but you're only required to complete one. So each one based on the level is different experience points. And I'll talk a little bit more about the tools that you can embed, but you could really, really build in your own learning adventure by just having your students go to tools that they're already aware of. So for example, Nearpod, here is a lesson all about being a digital citizenship on Nearpod. All they need to go here for 15 uh, experience points is to complete this Nearpod lesson. Built-in exit tickets. How are these students completing this? I turn these into a quiz. So when the student does take this, they can full name. They can tell me which one that they participated in. Okay, so obviously it's linking to itself. There we go. I'll have to fix that after. And then they can give me a reflection about what they learned and submit it. If you know anything about online gaming, um, navigational pieces, here's the home here. Another aspect to keep in mind, and I did link it into the slide deck presentation on how you can create your own leaderboard using um, Google uh, Sheets. So if I dip back into my presentation, here are a variety of ways that you can do that. Um, there's a multitude of ways that you can create your own leaderboard in Google Sheets. So here they are when they completed one, several. Um, again, they get to choose their own learning adventure. They minimally have to complete one of the adventures. Um, uh, they can complete all of the adventures like you see some of my students have done. And then it tallies up the points for you. And going home and just to show you that you can add stuff that you already have done. So if I go to Netty Quit and I had a Kahoot already made. So they could do the self-paced Kahoot. If you've never heard of Symbolu Learning Path, this is a pretty cool way to get students to learn on their own. And I also included elements of brain pop. And each one is worth a different, different um, experience points. Um, I think it's supporter. So here is a presentation that I already created. So I didn't reinvent the wheel. I didn't go back and say, you have to do this, have to do that. And here is the exit ticket. Uh, embedded right into the Google site. Here's a Google Sheets where they can sign up and participate in being in helping in the Google um, in the Google Cert help desk. So just to show you what that means, and notice the navigational is either this home button or the button up here. Okay. All right. So to show you what that meant is that you can link. Directly, so say you want them to submit in Google Classroom, you can link directly, okay, to that spot within your Google Classroom. So these are all just elements that you can think about while you're building your online adventure. So it's almost like if you've ever done anything with Classcraft, it kind of gives you that same um, element where you can, and I'll show you really quickly how to do that. If you go into the assignment, you go to copy link, and you can link it right to the assignment to have students submit. So here's your exit ticket. Please submit this assignment. Okay, so what does this look like behind the scenes? So I'm going to click on this button here. And if you're worried about, you know, publishing it outward, um, I do have to say that you can just publish within your domain or outside access, um, you don't have outside access. If you are using another site, such as Weebly, I know that for a fact, you could password protect Weebly. 
um, meaning that, you know, you can add another gaming element that, hey, you have to have your secret code to go in and participate in today's lesson. So behind the scenes, um, I just want to show you a couple of ways to build this. Is that if you go here and you look at the pages, you'll notice that all of my pages are grayed out. They're still active, obviously, because you see you can navigate through them, but you just can't see them in the menu. So that gives you kind of more of a gamification feel to it that you have a little bit of more of a um, ruling over where students can go. I, my, in fact, um, I wish they had this when I was teaching because I can see students building really awesome choose your own adventures or even having their own learning games for little for to uh, give to little to give to little kids to give to the younger students to see how they can play and interact. So that to do that, I will just build a page here and we'll call it example. Okay. And as example goes, if you go into the three dots and all you do is hide from navigation. And now it's hidden. You can still link to it, however. So let me go to the home page. And going in here, I am just going to insert an image from Google itself. We all need a help button. So I'll go ahead and insert that. Okay, so now a couple things um, you see here, you could insert the link and you could pick the page within your site. So I will link it to my example page. Click apply, click publish. Now I have this published outwardly so you can um, participate, everything is public. So you can go in and participate um, with this. So I just want to show you how that worked. So now on my homepage, I have this help button. And if I click here, I didn't add a back button, but you would do the same thing. You would add a button that says back or home. They can navigate up here. So none of the pages actually show up in the list and it's all kept within. Another thing that you can do using Google Sites is you can use Google Draw and you can make this, like for example, this map interactive where they can pick a, uh, maybe do a treasure hunt. I saw a really cool one built in Google Slides, and I know I'm on this Fortnite kit because I was woken up way too early for this, um, that they use, you know, where you drop with the, the map in the beginning, my Fortnite players, you can do that and make hotspots in the map and then get them uh, exactly where you want in the lesson. So you could totally make that interactive and that was completely done just using Google, uh, Google Draw here. All I did was just look up treasure map, put that in. And remember I showed you in Google Slides where we made that uh, transparent hotspot? Well, you, you might not want it completely transparent. So you might want to, you know, make it where it has a border around. But all you need to do is go into shapes. Again, draw a spot on your map. It automatically, because it remembers from the last time, and you just link it to the site. To do it this way, However, when you build the pages, oh, I don't want to call it home because we have a home, we'll call it homey. When you build the pages, you cannot hide them until after you link them in your Google Draw. So let me show you that really quickly. So we have home and homey, I'm going to click publish because you need to cap capture that active link first. So if I go back to here and I reload the page now, you're going to notice that my OMI now becomes uh, a part of a menu and we don't want that showing. We don't want to give them the ability to navigate through. We want to control that in navigation. So it has that element of game like control. So going in here to back to the map. Now we're going to go in and we are going to add our link to the map. Click apply. Then it's done. So now we what we need to do is we need to hide that navigational panel. There we go. All right, so going back here, now we hide the page, hide from navigation. 
going back to the home page, not homey page. This is automatically going to update for you also, which is pretty cool. So let me show you how I embedded this in here. I didn't download it. I didn't make it a JPEG. I didn't do anything. I just quickly inserted from my drive and I had to look it up. Map, called it map, original. And I clicked here and I clicked insert. And now this becomes an interactive image right within my Google site. So going back to here, which this isn't from Slides Media, these are awesome templates and they all link to their own page, their own element. Even though a student can navigate all the way through, you could take the same concept, the same idea, and now you can make it in a Google site, hiding the navigational pages. So you have more control over where the students get to visit and it has that more game like appeal. Some other ideas and elements. Oh, let me show you about the publishing first. When you go, and I love that Google decided to update a lot of this in the middle of uh, me teaching in a pandemic. Um, but in here, if you go to change, so you can share the draft with people, but you can change the public to restricted. So only certain parents, certain students can see the public or see your published site, or you could keep it within your domain. So you don't have to worry about only inviting st certain students. So that way you have this awesome experience that's very, you know, um, centered around your classroom, but you don't have to share it outwardly. Uh, you can uh, make copies of this. You can make one per class. So see you have one built and you teach two levels of third grade. You can go in and copy sites now, which is amazing. Thank you for allowing us to do that. And I have, it takes me a minute to find it, duplicate site. Um, if you are interested, so that's the only problem between, I believe sharing is caring. I want to, I want to share everything. And if you want to see how this is built and typically um, life got really crazy this week and I usually have set up tutorials for this. And I promise you, if you go to Bloom and Tech, I'll have them posted there, step-by-step step, everything I'm going through in a very slow down manner, broken down for you. But if you want a copy of my templates, just to see how I'm creating them, or if you wanna use them for yourself, you would have to email me personally. So feel free, I'll put my email back up in a couple of minutes. Feel free to email me and I will give you your own copy because I have to duplicate it and then um, let you allow you to make a copy of the website only in case something happens with the original. Um, that's the only downside to uh, sharing is that you would have full cap capability of editing everything. So I would make your own copy and then you can make a duplicate of that. So just to reiterate a couple of other resources that I have here for you is here are a variety of ways uh, in my slide presentation. They walk you through on how you can use Google Sheets as a leaderboard, uh, how you could do it automatically, okay? Um, going through here, here are some great resources and how you can add gaming elements um, to your class, to your uh, adventure. If you are looking for an end product, um, which eventually I will have an end product. Uh, I would advise having an, uh, an end product page where you give students choice to show, to demonstrate mastery, to demonstrate what they have learned. So um, for example, don't just have them make a poster in Glogster, if Glogster is still around. Um, and these are ways that I could be a good digital citizen. Have them make a commercial or a skit or a news report or a brochure or a pamphlet or something else to show, demonstrate knowledge collectively of what they've learned in this lesson. So eventually when I'm done with this, I'm going to have a, a landing page where they can choose how to show me and demonstrate what they've learned from this collective lesson. I also, um, if you're interested in gamification, and learning elements of gamification. Uh, class craft is amazing um, to bring gaming elements to your classroom. Uh, Game Star Mechanic, I, I can't say enough about this. Game Star Mechanic is if you want to teach about gaming with your students and you don't really want to worry about the coding, but you want to worry about the semantics, semantics of gaming, Game Star Mechanic is great. They learn about gaming 
while they game. It's um, free, freemium, great way to um, get students. This is where I typically started with students, and then we went to coding, and then they went into building um, a, a robust environment using GameStar Mechanic. So that was really quick. I know, I understand, but I do want to leave it for questions. If you want me to show you something again, if you um, want to know how I built something, I just want to leave that open for you right now. So many awesome tips in there, Amy. Yeah, we got some comments. Um, people have used GameStar mechanics. Yeah, it's great. I haven't used that one. It's great. It's one of my favorites. It's one of my go to's because it teaches the kids about the language of gaming and it takes away the coding aspect of it. So someone wrote, I'm imagining the fraction game I made on, in a site and wish they'd done it before. <laughs> Google Sites is amazing. It's gotten so dynamic. It has, it really has. And the ability to, what I love about it is, um, you know, I usually, you know, go with teachers and how to make digital portfolios. But what I really, really truly admire is say you want to take your younger students, you want to do this with them and you don't want them to leave uh, the website itself. So, so many times, you know, it's, it becomes a burden over complicated. So, let me show you, if you didn't know this, if I can type today, that would be lovely. All right, so we're gonna embed the whole page of Brain Pop in here, and now they can go through and interact with this website in here. So go through Publish. Refresh the page, and here we go. Here is Brain Pop built embedded right within here. So you can do like a direct link to what you want your students to do. So if you have them, you know, if you're having them learn about grammar, okay, and you can have them going directly to adverbs and say, oh, for this adventure, I would like you to watch the movie in Brain Pop and then complete the quiz, associated quiz or make a movie based on what you learned. So it's embedded right within this website. So that's another um, cool tip. And that's really where, if I go back to here, 5,000 tabs open, that's generally my life story. And I go back to supporter. And you'll see the Google site, uh, the Google slides is embedded right in. It's, it, I have learned that if it's less clicks for a student to go to, the better off it is for them. So again, um, just building that navigation within, I would love, 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 because Google Sites has come such a long way, really wish I was back in that classroom. So if you guys do anything with your students with this and have them build it, I would love, love, love to see. But, um, oh, the other thing I didn't show you is the template. So what I really also admired about this is what makes it really easy, especially for um, if, you know, for designing purposes and, putting together your choice. So uh, I, I built this just by doing these templates and adding either images or YouTube videos or direct links. So for example, if I'm going to do an image search and I don't know, we'll do Kahoot and I wanna do this. I th think that was giving me an issue before. And now I just bring it down to that. And now I can link directly to the Kahoot lesson that is in here. So it really builds an um, authentic learning environment where you don't have to think about the design process behind it. Because so often, if you're like me, I mean, I spent 45 minutes on deciding what shade of blue to put in my website. Um, the other thing you may have noticed is that I have this turned off. So just another little tip sometimes when you do this templates here, and you go to add a background in the back and I'll upload. And we'll just do the game star mechanic. Okay, and that's a really bad picture for an example, but it's adjusting for readability. All I did was delete this. And then now I want to take control over that readability. And this is a horrible example because this is not a good image. 
So this is how you can build your background where it can be more designed by you than having Google tell you you have to put the words here and the background gets kind of faded and you can't really see that. So those are some tips. And again, you can link directly to lessons. So if I were to have a student, like the final design is going to be, um, you know, submit, show me what you've learned for really quickly. I'm just gonna click a sign, you know, show me how you, your demonstration of knowledge using whatever tool that you decided to work with. And if I go back into here, and I feel like I'm putting everything at the bottom here, but that's okay. We can, again, insert an image. Uh, I spent, no, nope, we're not gonna do that one. Insert image, select. And for example, we will look up Google Classroom. And you can make it a common thing where if they see this icon, they know that they have to submit to Google Classroom. And if you just click insert, Again, you can easily move it around the screen and put that link in there. And now it's taking them directly to that uh, assignment where they can submit. Amy, I didn't know that. That's amazing. Yeah, you could have a lot of fun with this. So um, I, I, I didn't know you could link directly to. Yep submit in classroom I, I think that that um can solve a lot of problems because a lot of times we're trying to i say we as in i'm teaching students i'm problem solving with teachers about using different tools if we're using something like derek the other day was talking about um a choice board and so how do you submit work if you're also using google classroom mm -hmm. or you know schoology or, or something else how do you make it easy to be able to submit something from, you know, like a Google Doc or or whatever you're using for your choice board? Um, and to be able to put a link right there is awesome. Is that, I, I just love to make it the simpler, the better, and to keep everything in one place. You yeah. know what I mean? So, you know, your choice boards are great, but if you're working with your younger students, then you're having them navigate and if you see my screen and I literally have like four or five Google browsers open all with a million tabs and they have purpose but then for younger kids they uh it might be too much so when you're doing your choice board within Google sites and you're having them go to the site they can look at the site just like I put the brain pop in here one of these tabs somewhere around here I think it was under homey let me go to that. And then you can have them do their exit ticket right in here. Do they want to submit to Google Classroom? Do you want them to contribute to a Padlet? It's all right in here in one spot. I, I believe in simplicity. Also adding that value of choice um, is really big. Uh, that goes down to, you know, you could take the principles of that HyperDoc and the, you know, the principles of a choice board or tic-tac-toe board, and you could apply it here and enhance your engagement by doing the same principles. And you don't really need to reinvent your lesson. You just need to rethink your lesson. So giving them opportunities. I also, you know, you can, what I would advise, so you're not just pulling up points out of thin air, is looking at Webb's depth of knowledge, looking at Bloom's taxonomy, what would be worth more experience points? You could transfer that over to a grade, yes. Um, you know, and if you choose to do the leaderboard or not, that's, that's really up to your classroom, uh, how you set the norms for your classroom. Uh, you know, being in education for 15 years, some kids really thrived on that and some other kids felt a little overwhelmed and there's ways that you can hide the students' names on the leaderboard um, or color code them. And as you see here, I have, uh, you know, uh, pretend names here. So um, all of the images, uh, I have royalty free. They're from Free Pick. that's uh, paid or free. Um, and I built everything, I, I put it together using Canva. So, you know, if, if you're like me and you really get down to, I feel like I worry too much sometimes about design. Um, those are little tips and tools that I've used to design. 
the website, um, pixabay.com is another great resource for free, royalty-free imagery. So we need to keep in mind, you know, who are target audiences. If you're publishing out, you can't just take any um, pictures from the web. So great royalty-free websites is Pixabay also. Those are free, 100% free, where uh, free pick is free and paid. Yes, Canva is amazing. Yes. Okay, I'm sorry, I can't get off this <laughs> link to submit because now I'm thinking about, and, and I apologize because it's not about gaming, but I'm thinking about all our teachers who teach primary and are using Seesaw. And one of the big problems is being able to submit work easily and organize things easily. And I'm I'm just beginning to think about how that trick might work with Seesaw if it could. I know we have some Seesaw users in our audience. Yeah, it's um, you know, you just have to biggest thing is you have to make sure that you're logged in to I mean, obviously this took you to the um, teacher page and we all know the teacher page looks completely different from the student page but um yeah that's something that you know you can send to your you know I in let me go to classwork and you know you go here as a teacher view assignment and look at that if I had students in here this would send them um, a link notification too hmm. so those are just some things like to think about um, as you're going through, you know, I mean, I think the biggest thing now I hear from a lot of teachers like, but what about accountability? What about assessment? And what is the easiest way to do that? So I say, what about engagement and giving them voice mm -hmm. and choice and showing uh, alternative ways to address their understanding and make learning fun? Yeah, definitely. Is there any other questions? All right, well, everybody, you've been great. <laughs> um, if you do have any other questions, again, I'll put my contact info out there. I usually, I don't believe in one and done. I usually have follow-up tutorials, so please look for that. And I'll break down a couple of the um, tools that I use, and I'll break down how I did this. Um, but it's all here on this page. Um, if you have any questions, you can email me directly. Please, please, please uh, don't feel like you can't reach out and ask questions. So. Thank you, Amy. Thank you so much for Thank doing this you. today. I know it's a, a super busy week, uh, and so we appreciate your time. Oh, absolutely. I'll leave this up here for another minute if you want to grab my information. All right, Andy. Thanks, Amy. Great job. So tomorrow, two mm -hmm. more presentations. We have Mary Howard and Rob Dunlop. So mm -hmm. two more dynamic present presenters and then on Friday we're going to have a panel discussion with all of our fabulous presenters and they will we will ask them questions about solving all ed tech problems and <laughs> well, so. yes if anybody has suggestions for questions Kyle and I were uh, brainstorming <laughs> a little bit today about what we would ask but happy to take questions from the audience for sure so by Friday, mm -hmm. we'll have all education problems solved. <laughs> uh, promises, promises. <laughs> um, yeah, so there's some comments here. I would love to either watch this presentation again or look at the slides again, share with others. So all of this, um, all of the presentations are being recorded and being posted on the website, as well as the presentations are posted there, contact information. And the web address is? EIT.ly slash TIFF Summit. Perfect. All one word. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So until tomorrow and then Friday, we will see you then. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Amy. on it.